Thank you, Sean. Um, now, tonight, I know we have a few science teachers in the audience. Um, can you put your hands up, please? I know you're out there. <laughs> Hello. Um, so, these, these guys, um, I hope you were inspired by that talk. You could be um, some of the unsung heroes that go on to to inspire people to great discoveries and Nobel Prizes, or not Nobel Prizes, but the great discoveries either way. And our final speaker, and final speaker with an Erdosh Bacon number, is Professor Ian Wanless. Ian Wanless is a future form of <laughs> future former future fellow in a school of mathematical sciences at Monash University. His area of research is combinatorics, including the art of counting when you run out of fingers and toes. Ladies and gentlemen, Ian Wanless. Hello, my name is Ian and I am a mathematician. And I would like to welcome you to the Brunswick chapter of Scientists Anonymous. Yes, I am a mathematician, I've said it now. It always starts with just a small sum after dinner and then, you know, before I know it, it's 3 a.m. and I've been solving equations all night. <laughs> now the empty set is my friend and I even proved theorems before breakfast, so I guess I need serious help. And that's why I've chosen to stand here before you and tell my story. The story starts on the 15th of April, 1707, in Basel, Switzerland, with the birth of a boy, Leonard, who's already been mentioned tonight, uh, to Marguerite and Paul Euler. That's Euler, spelled E-U-L-E-R. As with all kids whose name is not spelt phonetically, I'm sure he endured all the usual playground talks. You know, Euler's a spuler, and so on. Doesn't make any sense, but it still wounds. So he would patiently remind them that actually his name was pronounced Euler, and they'd all assume that he wanted to grow up and be a car mechanic. But cars weren't invented yet, so he'd have to try maths instead. <laughs> actually, it, didn't, it didn't, didn't always look like that was gonna be the case because his father, Paul, was a Lutheran minister and wanted him to follow him into the church. So he made him concentrate on theology, Hebrew, and Greek, and he sent him to a school that didn't even teach maths. But luckily he did concede to let Euler hang out on weekends with a family friend whose name was Johann Bernoulli, a famous scientist and kind of a handy guy in this story, because it's Bernoulli we have to thank for nurturing Euler's genius and for recognizing his true talent. By the ripe old age of 17, he had a master's degree from the University of Basel for a dissertation comparing the philosophies of Descartes and Newton. And shortly after that, he made his first big splash, as it were, for a analysis of the optimal place to put masts on a ship. At this point in Euler's life, he had never seen a ship. But luckily, he avoided ridicule and suggested that probably the mast should go on top, not on the side or underneath. <laughs> at age 19, he applied for a post in physics at the University of Basel and was rejected and bitterly disappointed to be rejected in what must go down in the history of hiring committees as the equivalent of that guy who failed to sign the Beatles because he thought bands with guitars were on the way out. So he went for plan B, which was seven weeks trek away in St. Petersburg at the Russian Academy of Sciences, the new Imperial Russian Academy of Sciences, where he was actually offered a post in physiology, a subject that he taught himself after getting the job offer. <laughs> when he got there, he was uh, actually seconded to the Russian Navy because they'd read on his CV that he was an expert on ships. So. But it turned out that wasn't the case, and also physiology wasn't really his thing. Uh, so after a few years, they gave him a gig in maths department, and finally he had found his niche. He was to be, go on to become the most prolific mathematician of all time. Not only did he father 13 children, but he also fathered just about as many branches of mathematics. Truly a seminal contribution, if ever there was one. <laughs> Anyone who's ever studied mathematics in any seriousness will have met Euler's work, even if you didn't know it. And, I, and I'm guessing that's probably a larger slab of this uh, crowd than in most other watering holes on Sydney Road. Uh, you've all met Euler's work. Even at a very basic level, he was the first person to think about functions in the modern sense and to write f brackets of x for the function of x. And he either invented or popularized much of the other notation that we just take as standard and given today including i for the square root of minus one, e for the base of the natural logarithm, and pi for the ratio of circumference to diameter of circle. These three quantities combine in a most sublime and 
fascinating way in what's known as Euler's identity, which states that e to the i times pi plus one is equal to zero. In 1988, the readers of Mathematical Intelligentsia voted this the most beautiful formula of all time. Who knew that they had beauty pageants for formulae? <laughs> I like to think of this as a sort of universe competition. That's a bit like a Miss Universe competition, but with fewer swimsuits. In any case, uh, Euler didn't just take out first place, he also won second and fifth prize as well. Try doing that at Miss Universe. <laughs> the great Laplace, himself no slouch with a slide rule, was to exhort his students to read Euler, read Euler, he is the master of us all. But if you were to read Euler, presumably twice as Laplace suggested, it would take you some time because Euler wrote nearly 900 papers at rate of roughly 800 pages per year, accounting for one-third of humanity's output of mathematical ideas in the second half of the 18th century. Now, I couldn't possibly do justice to that output, so I'm not even going to bother to try. I'm going to choose my two favorite papers, which are more or less incidental footnotes in Euler's career, but happen to lay the foundation for pretty much everything I've done in mine. The first is from 1735, and it's on the bridges of Königsberg. You won't find Königsberg on a modern map. Nowadays, it's called Kaliningrad, and it's a Russian Baltic port in that little bit of Russia that's disconnected from the rest by Latvia and Lithuania. In Euler's day, there was a network of seven bridges in Königsberg, connecting both banks of the Prigel River with two large islands in the middle of the river. Because my kitchen rules wasn't yet screening, <laughs> the good burghers of Königsberg would amuse themselves on a summer evening by taking a stroll and trying to cross every one of the seven bridges without recrossing any one of them. But somehow it never seemed to work out. Was it actually impossible? Well, when Euler heard this question, he did what any self-respecting candidate for greatest mind of all time would do. He invented an entire new branch of mathematics in order to solve it. <laughs> that branch of mathematics is what's known as graph theory, and it keeps a number of people in this room off the streets, including me. A graph in this context is not the same thing as a plot of a function. You should think of it more as a network. So these could be computer networks, blood vessels, food webs, polymer chains, social networks, communication networks, whatever. You know, all really important things to understand in the modern world, which explains why there's now more than 5,000 papers every year in the mathematics of graph theory. And Euler wrote the very first paper on the subject. Everyone was duly impressed. Everyone that is, except for the poor citizens of Königsberg, who now had nothing to do for the next two centuries until TV came along. <laughs> now, you may be getting the, intention, uh, the, the impression that Euler was an overachiever, and you would be right. But it came at a cost. At around this time, he was to lose sight in his right eye, which he attributed to all the cartography work he was being asked to do in poor light, Conveniently neglecting to mention the fact that he probably spent every other waking moment poring over mathematical manuscripts in poor light, but that was the stuff he wanted to do, so that clearly wasn't the problem. In any case, his reputation was growing. 1741, uh, King Frederick II of Prussia was looking to boost his street cred. So he summoned his image consultants and said, I'm tired of being known as Frederick the Pretty Good. What can I do to improve my epithet? And so they had a brief huddle, and then they reported, Sire, we have the perfect solution for you. How about a pet mathematician? <laughs> and so it was that Euler moved to the Berlin Academy of Sciences, where he would spend the next 25 years of his life working for Frederick, now Frederick the Great, of course, who uh, didn't seem to appreciate him nearly as much as perhaps he should have. In fact, he thought it that Euler was a bit of a country bumpkin and was on record as having found his conversation unsophisticated. Well, that marks Frederick as the first and last person in history to ever employ a mathematician for their sparkling conversation. <laughs> but anyway, uh, he also uh, rather unkindly referred to Euler as my limited cyclops, which, you know, if that's his benchmark of sophisticated conversation, it might, in a roundabout way, indicate why Euler didn't reach that mark. <laughs> Meanwhile, back in Russia, uh, Catherine the Passably Okay had ascended the throne. 
And in 1766, she extended an invitation to Euler for him to return to St. Petersburg, which he jumped at the chance. I mean, uh, he wasn't happy in Berlin, and, and so he left Berlin and moved to St. Petersburg, where he would spend the rest of his life, in the pay of Catherine, now Catherine the Great, of course, uh, who treated him much better than Frederick the Greatly Ungrateful ever did. <laughs> which is just as well, because other things weren't going so well for Euler. In 1771, his house burnt down with the loss of his precious library. In 1773, his dear wife, Katharina, died, presumably exhausted by all his children. And to top it all off, in that period, he also developed a cataract in his other eye and lost the sight in that as well. Incredibly, being completely blind did nothing to halt his progress. And legend has it that he would dictate profound new ideas and complex calculations at a speed that the scribe could barely keep up with while nursing several wriggling grandchildren on his knee. And it's in this manner that he wrote the second paper I wanted to talk about, which is on the 36 officer problem. So you have 36 military officers from six different regiments and holding six different ranks. Uh, so you have one officer of each rank from each regiment. And the question is, can they march in a square formation so that each rank and file, that's row and column to our civvies, each row and column should have one officer of each rank and one officer from each regiment in it. Again, to uh, study this problem, Euler introduced an important idea to mathematics, and that idea is what we now call a Latin square. A Latin square is a very simple definition. It's just a matrix where you have some symbols, and each of the symbols occurs in every, run, in every row and every column, just in a different order. Hmm, where might I have seen one of those before? Sound familiar? Yes, well, you see them on pretty much the every newspaper's puzzle page, because a completed Sudoku puzzle is, in fact, an example of a Latin square. As always, Euler was many years ahead of his time. But he wasn't aiming to amuse bored housewives and commuters. No, he had important military maneuvers to conduct. In order to solve his 36 officer problem, he would need two Latin squares, one which would say where the regiments go, and the other would say where the ranks go. And these two Latin squares should have the a uh, special property that when you combine them by overlaying, you get every combination of a rank and a regiment occurring together once. We say that such Latin squares are orthogonal, and so a more prosaic way of phrasing the 36 officer problem is, do there exist orthogonal Latin squares of order six? Euler was convinced the answer was no. He had managed to construct orthogonal Latin squares of orders three, four, five, seven, eight, nine, 11, 12, 13, and so on, and he was convinced that the ones he hadn't managed to build didn't exist. So that's orders 2, 6, 10, 14, and so on. He wasn't able to prove it, though, so this became known as Euler's conjecture. And over the intervening years, uh, mathematicians found many good reasons to care about this conjecture, and it became quite a big deal. So much so that when, in 1959, Bose, Srikandi, and Parker announced that they had disproved Euler's conjecture, it was reported in the New York Times on the front page. Now. Those were the days. I mean, these, <laughs> these days, your, your newspaper's just full of stories that prove that, you know, royals are fertile and celebrities aren't good role models and different religions don't get on and, and things like this. But in 1959, they reported real news. And this was a big deal. Euler, the greatest mathematician of all time, had got it wrong. And not just a little bit wrong, actually quite spectacularly wrong. So depending on whether your glass is half full or half empty, you'll either find this very heartening or very depressing that even the greatest mind can goof so badly. But I suppose we should cut the old man some slack. I mean, he was 72 and completely blind at the time he made that conjecture. And actually, in the same paper, he did a lot of very nice work and very accurate work, including starting the noble sport of counting Latin squares. Now, you may think that in you mastered uh, counting in prep school and then went on to the hard stuff, but people who work in combinatorics like me seem to spend a lot of our time trying to work out how to count. Maybe we're just retarded, I don't know. <laughs> but that's not a word you could ever apply to Euler. And he did, he did very nicely count the Latin squares up to size five, five by five. And since then, every now and then, another order has been counted. The last order to be done by hand was counted by a Frenchman, Albert Sard, in 1947. No mean feat when you realize that he had to count 16,942,080 Latin squares by hand. 
Perhaps he had inherited some masochistic tendencies from his great-great-grandfather, who by coincidence was a contemporary of Euler and is probably better known to you as the Marquis de Sade. Skip forward now to 2003, and I'm at a peace rally uh, protesting the, I should say, an invasion of Iraq, um, and I find myself getting increasingly angry at what our leaders can't see and everyone else can. Whilst savoring the delicious irony of being at a peace march and wanting to punch John Howe's lights out, I remember the advice that mothers often give their children. When you find yourself getting angry, count up to 10. Now, I'm not sure how that helps, but in any case, I was really, really angry, and counting up to 10 was clearly going to be inadequate. So I turned to my colleague who happened to be with, it, with me at this rally, and I said, why don't we count the Latin squares of order 11, which we duly did. And it turns out that there are 776, 966, 83, 61717, 3242306820682311065600000 Latin squares of order 11. Which, which is surely enough to leave us tired and not angry, so maybe mum was onto something after all. <laughs> I'd love to know what Euler would make of this result that he inspired. I think he would have actually liked it. He was no stranger to large numbers, and he was, after all, the 18th century supercomputer. I mean, his, his feats of mental arithmetic and uh, memory are literally the stuff of legend. So I think he would have liked it. But it's also interesting to ponder what he might have achieved if he didn't have to rely so heavily on those abilities. I don't know, maybe he would have just wasted his life answering emails and surfing the web. You, never, you never can tell. <laughs> What I can tell you is that Euler is now buried, along with uh, Tchaikovsky and Dostoevsky and other great minds, in the necropolis at Alexander Nevsky Monastery in St. Petersburg. He may be no longer with us, but his mathematics very much is. It's flourishing all around us. So this is a story that never ends. But it's been very therapeutic for me to tell you how it started. So thank you for listening to my story. Thank you.